I think what we do is called the molecular engineering. My definition of molecular engineering is that you take uh, simple um, building blocks and assemble them and, and, and assemble them into structures uh, that will have useful properties. Uh, so the best molecular engineer is actually um, in biology, right? Uh, so if you think about uh, uh, nature takes amino acids uh, and then assemble them into proteins that do all kinds of fascinating work. Uh, so that's really the best molecular engineering you can imagine. We of course do something very fundamental, but we try to take a lot of inspirations uh, from biology. Uh, so we uh, try to create materials that, that have uh, some similar properties. For example, we try to create uh, synthetic enzymes uh, using polymeric nanoparticles that have actually uh, active sites so that, that can bind their substrate and also have catalytic groups in the right place for the transformation. We also try to make uh, these materials like uh, synthetic antibodies uh, uh, and they can recognize a variety of uh, uh, molecules uh, like small molecule drugs uh, glycans uh, and peptides. Uh, so we try to use them for various applications. So because we're trying to make these synthetic enzymes, we really try to use them to uh, to do very useful transformations. In one recent uh, JAX paper we published this year, we actually built these uh, synthetic um, enzymes to hydrolyze uh, cellulose. Cellulose uh, is, of course, in biomass, uh, uh, very important in biomass conversion, but it's highly crystalline. Um, it's actually very difficult to, to hydrolyze them, uh, even with enzymes, because it's uh, so insoluble. So we actually build these synthetic enzymes uh, that can bind a part of the cellulose chain and position two catalytic groups, two acidic catalytic groups uh, right at the glycosidic bond to hydrolyze. So that actually mimics uh, um, what uh, natural cellulase uh, have in their active site. Uh, and what we found is uh, uh, the activity is getting close to some of the natural enzymes. However, because these are made of uh, polymeric nanoparticles, uh, uh, they are soluble in water and soluble in some ionic liquids, uh, uh, which can dissolve uh, cellulose. So now you can do this as a homogeneous reaction, so, so we can have far better um, uh, reactivity as a result. Uh, so these are one type of application uh, for our materials uh, because we're also making these materials as synthetic antibodies. We're trying to put them inside the cell uh, to intervene certain biological um, uh, events. Uh, those, of course, uh, are done with uh, collaboration. I think in my group, students mostly acquire three types of skills. Uh, the first one is design of materials. Uh, a lot of our designs come from uh, uh, inspiration from nature, so we try to mimic, uh, like I said, uh, uh, natural enzymes or antibodies. Uh, so we try to uh, understand how do we build these materials in a much simpler way and more robust, uh, but with similar features. Uh, so this is one big part of the skill understand the correlation between structures and properties uh, and uh, to be able to design new materials. Uh, uh, now, of course, after you design them, you have to make them in the lab. So every student in our group uh, uh, have to learn organic synthesis of small molecules and uh, polymeric materials as well. And the third type of skill is really in uh, analytical characterization of these materials. Once you build the materials, you want to understand how they perform uh, for different purposes, whether in catalysis or in binding of certain uh, drug molecules, for example. And so then we use a variety of uh, analytical techniques such as ITC, fluorescence, UV-Vis, NMR, etc., trying to understand the performance of materials. I think I'm definitely a mixed approach uh, uh, regarding to students work in the lab. I'm very hands-off. Uh, I don't go into the lab, check on students, you know, every day. Uh, but uh, regarding research, uh, I'm very hands-on in the sense uh, that I meet with my students every week and talk about research strategies uh, and how to solve problems and uh, experimental design. So in those parts, I'm very, very hands-on. 
Uh, in the past, uh, a lot of our research is really done in-house. Uh, we design our materials, we make them, and we study their performance. However, as we get into biological applications, uh, this is where collaboration becomes really important because we're chemists, we really don't have time uh, to learn all the biology and uh, uh, to do uh, some of the intricate cellular experiments. Uh, and so in a recent Jack's paper, we're working on uh, using our materials to inhibit phosphorylation or peptides. Uh, we can do a lot of this in our, uh, uh, in our lab and using HPLC to monitor the phosphorylation. However, when you get into more complex phosphorylation, that's similar to what happens in cell. So these are very complex uh, um, protein complexes. So one part of the complex is the uh, kinase, which is the enzyme that catalyzes the phosphorylation. So these are not uh, uh, not materials you can buy as you need protein exp uh, expression and different techniques to understand how these phosphorylation happens. Uh, so in this project we actually worked with uh, Eric Underbaki from uh, BBMB and they are already working on this system, trying to understand how these phosphorylation affects the, tri the signal transduction in biology. So this is a perfect example. We have developed the tools to uh, inhibit uh, the phosphorylation. They have the system they're trying to understand in biology. And so then we have the collaboration. Very quickly, we're able to finish the work and then publish a JAX paper. Uh, another example is um, collaborative proposal with Amy Andriotti and she's been working on uh, kinase catalyzed phosphorylation in uh, signal transduction and so we started collaborating and, and using our materials um, trying to move uh, these uh, organic nanoparticles that mimic uh, uh, antibodies to uh, move them inside the cell to inhibit specific uh, phosphorylation and they see how that affects the six, si uh, signal transduction pathway. Some students uh, uh, find jobs in um, academic uh, 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 institutions. Uh, I have, uh, for example, a graduate student, uh, uh, Roshan Ganasikara. Right now he is uh, an assistant professor at Yale Medical School. So. He was trained as a chemist, uh, 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 of course, in my group. Uh, and we were working on uh, using the ma these materials to bind biologic targets. So, so he went to medical school for a po postdoc and later on um, became an assistant professor there. Uh, I also have a, a PhD, Joseph Wino. He is currently a teaching assistant professor at Iowa State University. Um, I have a postdoc, uh, uh, Shi Yong Zhang, who uh, got uh, who, who did uh, um, three year postdoc in my group, uh, published nine first author papers. Uh, and he went back to China, uh, immediately became a full professor. Uh, so these are examples of students who went to academia. I would say many students went to industry, many of them in uh, multinational corporations. Uh, uh, so Wei Xiang Ru, uh, who was my very first graduate student, he is uh, at DuPont right now. Uh, Gitka uh, Chara, uh, she is a manager advisor. Um, I also have Hongguan uh, Hong Cho, he is uh, working at uh, LG.